This is Heart Rhythm TV. I'm Roderick Tung. On this episode, we are featuring a very provocative physiologic pacing related study as it relates to half half. And I'm joined by Dan Lustgarden and Maggie Infeld from the University of Vermont. Welcome, Dan, and welcome, Maggie. Thanks so much. Thank you, Rod. My pace, JAMA Cardiology, February 1st, 2023. Accelerated heart rate versus control. Dan, you talked about this at the Physiology Pacing Symposium and said this could be the next biggest thing I do, and this could be the next biggest thing that we do for the field. Tell us a little bit about where the, the whole hypothesis that diastolic heart failure and half path might need faster heart rates rather than blocking them down and slowing them so they get better filling. Yeah. So the idea really uh, begins with my uh, colleague, Marcus Meyer, who was formerly at the University of Vermont um, and more recently recruited to University of uh, Minnesota. Um, and Marcus had been interested in uh, uh, sort of the starting point, I think, for him was noticing that patients with HEFPEF uh, didn't tolerate uh, beta blockade. Um, and he started chatting with me about this observation, wondering, well, you know, why is it? What is it particularly about beta blockers that are bad for these folks? Um, and his hypothesis was that a slow heart rate is, is problematic for a stiff heart because the longer the diastolic filling time, the higher the pressure because of increased volume. Um, and when we started chatting about this idea, well, the, the obvious converse to that is that, well, maybe by accelerating their rate, you might be able to improve filling dynamics and improve how they feel and perhaps improve outcomes. Um, and one of those outcomes that I conjectured would be improved would be atrial fibrillation because of the increased LV pressure that translates to increased LA pressure and stretch. And as we know, stretch is certainly something that is um, uh, that participates in the pathoetiology of AFib. Um, and also I pointed out to him, well, you know, obviously the, the only intervention that you can do to do this, uh, to accelerate their rates is to pace them. But if you're going to pace them, you have to pace them in a way that completely recapitulates normal activation. Otherwise, you're going to trade off some aspect of abnormal pacing for potential benefit. Uh, and that's where the concept of holistic pacing emerges in this story. So Maggie, then you take 107 patients, you randomize them 50 versus 57. Tell us a little bit about what a personalized heart rate is and then what you found. Yes, um, so we so Marcus Meyer um, developed an algorithm to predict resting heart rate based on um, epidemiologic data that showed that height was an independent predictor of resting heart rate. And so the algorithm um, took into account patient's height and their ejection fraction to predict a personalized resting heart rate for them. Our study, um, we enrolled patients with stage B and C HEFPEF um, who had specialized pacing systems that would not induce um, RV dyssynchrony during pacing. And uh, we randomized them to either keep their lower rate at 60 or um, increase their rate to a personalized rate based on that heart rate algorithm. We then followed them for a year and our primary outcome was quality of life. We also looked at AF burden, uh, patient activity level um, detected by the pacemaker and um, uh, NT pro BNP. And you get a home run, right? Because living with heart failure Minnesota score better um, in terms of physical activity levels, NT pro BNP and incident AF all were improved. Yes, the story was consistent across all those outcomes. And therefore, and congratulations, you and Dan want the community and all of us to believe that that 10 beats per minute difference, 65 versus 75, has very meaningful physiologic difference. Um, yes, we think that based on human studies, animal studies, um, and heart failure literature showing that lowering filling pressures chronically has good outcomes and heart rate being a method to lower filling pressure, that it is good. We aren't suggesting to increase the lower rate setting on standard pacemaking systems. And we also think this is like too, you know, too new for prime time, but we think that 
rethinking liberalizing heart rates by de-escalating beta blockers or AV nodal blockade in HEFPEF patients who don't have a strong indication would be a safe and good way to apply this data. And we don't have many out, you know, opportunities for HEFPEF. As we know, you know, deliver just showed SGLT2 inhibitors may be a benefit, maybe CCM, you know, impulse dynamics and aim higher, but there aren't many options. So this is really, really exciting, which is why Dan will probably be talking about this at Physiological Pricing Symposium again. You know, so Dan, where are we going with this? And what are some of the other variables that are unclear? You know, what about the AV delay in the pyramidal? Does that was not studied in here? We are studying. No, that. Uh, right. Yeah. So uh, obviously, you know, as I pointed out in in uh, the meeting that we recently had. Out in Seattle, uh, you know, the reason that I use the word holistic is is really it should be an aspirational one. What we're trying to leverage is an incredibly complex system of autonomic interaction and electrical activation and conduction. Um, and it is naive to think that any uh, current pacemaker is going to be able to do all of that. Um, however, we can use them better than we've been using them uh, using you know, a current existing technology. So where what we're really interested in is we want to know how important is it, for example, we place the lead at Bachman's bundle. Is Bachman bundle the right target? How do you identify it? We think we know how to identify it, but we have to study this in larger populations. We need to be able to democratize uh, our approach uh, and show that it has meaningful implications. Uh, we need to understand the relationship of Bachman bundle pacing to the PR interval. Uh, there are, you know, AV hysteresis algorithms in place that maybe they're good enough, maybe they're not. Uh, but these certain these sorts of things need to be, you know, this this level of granularity all has to be uh, explored at much greater depth for certain. Um, the other aspect of this to bear in mind is HEFPEF is a heterogeneous population of patients. So clearly, this isn't going to work for every single half PEF patient. Um, so we need to really focus on who are the people who really could benefit from increasing their heart rate. Well, then let's talk a little bit about rapid HF, because that was a late breaker from New Orleans from ACC, and that was looking at rate adaptive atrial pacing and its impact on exercise capacity in those with half PEF. That did not show as favorable of an outcome with higher rates and rate adaptive pacing. Uh, true, true, unrelated, related, or are these totally different questions? Definitely related. And the study design, I think, is probably the critical difference. Um, the patients in, in rapid uh, HF had a right atrial appendage pacing leads. The price to pay for right atrial appendage pacing is going to increase with increased heart rate, because the interatrial delay that is certainly consequent and in fact demonstrated in the right atrial appendage is going to more meaningfully impact the relationship between left atrial activation and left ventricular activation as heart rate increases. So at a minimum, I would have predicted that would have been problematic in this patient population. Maggie, any thoughts on its relationship to rapid HF? Um, so first of all, I think that, you know, the my pace and rapid HF studies were complementary um, because they asked fundamentally different questions. Um, the rapid study was looking at rate adaptive pacing during exercise. They didn't pace at all during rest. The my pace study was focused on rest heart rates to um, reduce um, filling pressures chronically over one year. So just fundamentally different questions different patient populations. Our study had older patients with a standard pacing indication um, with average resting heart rates of 65. The rapid HF study, their resting heart rates were 80 um, at baseline um, and different study endpoints. So I think just apples and oranges really of studies, um, complementary, very different. Well, so much more to come in this very exciting field of electrical stimulation, optimizing rates, in diastolic heart failure and half path. Congratulations, Dan. Congratulations, Maggie. This is truly physiologic because again, what Dan is talking about is that there's always a trade-off when you pace. And even RA pacing we think is physiologic because now we have conduction system pacing and by V, 
It's not because you have atrial desynchrony, and that's why you're really pushing us towards Bachman's bundles, which is also very exciting. So thank you very much for joining us on Heart Rhythm TV. Dan and Maggie, and congratulations on my pace. Thank you so much. Thank you for the opportunity, Ron.